Well, good morning, Northridge. Won't you stand with us? Let's sing and worship together. It's the way you move in everything you do. Come on, put your hands together. The way you touch my heart. This is why sing to you this morning. This is a new song. Our hope is in the one true God. Let's sing together. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising high. Hey! 
Jesus, celebrate the hope that we have in him.
us, Lord, come and speak to us. Come and move in our hearts. Come and show us who you are. Change us, Lord. Help us to be more like Jesus and more like you designed for us to be. Amen. Amen. Well, what a privilege to worship with you here today. It's so good to be with people, right? I'm thankful for everybody online. I know I've watched online. And I'm so just glad that we can be together. Um, at this time, we're gonna continue our worship by receiving an offering. If this is your first time here, we don't want anything from you. This is a chance for us to give back to God out of what he's already given to us. But before we do that, let's pray. God, thank you that when you move, things can change. That when you do something, God, things are made to move. And so, Lord, this has been a really difficult season for, I would be willing to say all of us, God, and I know that it's been tough for me. And so, even on the darkest days, Lord, like we sang, that help us to lift our hands and praise you, Lord, even if it's just in the car, in our room for a minute, to say, Lord, today I'm gonna choose to praise you with how I'm living, how I'm thinking, how I'm walking. Help us, God, to set our minds on you so that we can remember who our hope is and we can remember who we can trust. And thank you, God, that um, when you come in the room, you can change us and change our circumstances. So we're gonna trust you. We're gonna wait on you, God. I feel like this has been a year of just waiting. So we can't wait to see what you're gonna do with our waiting, God. You never waste a moment. And we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. had a lot of people tell me I'm lucky, but I tell them I'm chosen. My name is Karabo Maretlani. I was born in Lesotho, Southern Africa, and was raised in the villages. When I was about five years old, I lost my father. And not long after my father's death, my mother left me at my grandmother's house and I never saw her for years. So my grandmother became a mother. She told me a lot of things, including how to read and write. But most importantly, she told me about God. Loneliness in my life began when I lost my grandma, the woman who raised me. I had to say goodbye to my love, to my grandmother. Then a year after my grandma's passing, my mother also passed away. I was faced with the sad reality of being an orphan, which is something that I dreaded the most. I had a home and a house in the villages, but I had no parents. I was alone. My uncle brought me into his home in the city. It was there in the city that I, I met a friend, actually who invited me to a church. There was a truck filled with these shoeboxes. I received a shoebox myself. And I remember that shoebox filled one of the holes in my heart, and that was the hope of having something that belonged to me. I had lost everything, so the gift of the box gave me that hope this belongs to me, and it really filled my heart. I realized God gave me what I was always in need of. I made a choice to personally seek Him. Today, I have a family and I'm no longer an orphan. I know I'm chosen. Someone took their time to work hard and to pack my shoebox, and God used them to give me hope and to feel what my heart was in need of. So today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I'm asking you to go prepare a gift today. Take a shoebox. Give someone hope and love somebody today. 
and spread the gospel. Well, good morning, Northridge. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Great to see you all over the auditorium. And for those of you here in Plymouth, thanks for being in person. It makes communicating so much more fun. For those of you at our regional campuses, Gross, Eel, and Brighton, we're so grateful for you gathering, for you connecting, being a part of this one church that has three campus locations. But for those of you online, man, we're glad you're here. You, you've expanded us from three locations to hundreds of locations and around the world. So we're gathered together in Jesus' name. And if you're a guest, welcome to this Northridge family where God's doing so many great things. We're in a series called God is Both Builder and Rebuilder. And the truth is we all need it because though all of us have experienced the positive building in our life in some aspect or other, in one area or other of our lives, we've all messed that up too. So if all God does is build, we're in trouble, but God doesn't just build, He also rebuilds when we trust Him, when we let Him, and that's what we're looking at in this 2020 season, the need for rebuilding in every area of our lives. I'd be curious, since I have some of you live here with me, and you can play along with me and chat it up online as well, but how many of you have learned more valuable lessons the hard way than the easy way? Raise your hand. Yeah, me too. I don't know why, but I'm like a three baseball bat to the head kind of learner. You know, it's like, I, I just, I just can't learn the valuable lessons the easy way. It's, it's, it's always a difficult process for me. And, and one of the hard lessons that I've learned is that I, I've missed out on a ton of the potential that God has given me in life. I've missed out on a ton of the positive experiences that God intends for me in life simply because I gave up a little too soon. I just gave up a little too soon. I, I quit. I love it. The team found, we have a creative team here. They're, they're, you know, equal. There's no one equal to them. They're phenomenal. They found a picture that that says it better than my words ever could. Don't give up. Your breakthrough may be closer than you think. And I, that bottom picture, that's the way I've learned. It's like, you know, you, you get so close to, to the fulfillment. You get so close to the promise. He's right there by the diamonds. He's been working for, imagine how long he's been pickaxing. And just before he gets there, he turns and walks away in discouragement. And I've done this so much, so much that God had for me and planned for me, I've missed out on because I just gave up too soon. And this isn't just me. This is the human malady. This is all of our problems. And this is the reality that I want you to see. We experience the loss of potential, diminished potential, and we experience decline in our lives and decay instead of growth and expansion. We experience in our lives destruction because when things get tough, we tend to quit. It's a natural pattern to give up, to quit, to walk away. And what I want you to see is there are certain areas that are really, really a part of this natural bent of ours. We, we tend to lose out in life and miss our potential because by nature, when things get tough, we quit doing what we can and should be doing. Let's be honest, there's a lot that we can't do in life. There's a lot that's beyond our control. There's a lot that's beyond our access. There are many things that we just can't functionally remove. They're just bigger than we are. But there's always a few things that we can and should be doing no matter how tough life gets, but we generally quit on those things. I love how the book of Proverbs explains it. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled. This person who's just given up on getting out of bed and going and doing anything and even trying anymore, a sluggard's appetite 
is never filled. But the desires of the diligent, the one that keeps getting out of bed, keeps getting off the couch, keeps going out and doing what they can and should be doing, they're fully satisfied. So what's the difference between the one whose appetite is never filled and the one who's fully satisfied? The one who's fully satisfied, no more control as a human being than the other one, but they keep getting up and doing what they can and should be doing. They don't quit slinging and swinging the pickaxe. Proverbs 24, sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. Let's be honest, human beings can't grow anything. We can't miraculously make a seed turn into a living plant. We can't do it. We can't take a seed and, and create a harvest. That's something only God can do. But it will never happen if we don't do what we can and should be doing. We've got to plow. We've got to pick up the rocks. We've got to plant. We've got to water. We've got to nurture the soil around it. We have to do what we can do, and then God does what he can do. But if we don't do what we can and should do, what happens? There's no harvest because there's been no seed planted. We just quit doing what we can and should be doing. What is it that you can and should be doing that you've quit on? It's a part of your problem. It's a part of my problem. Very often we experience diminished potential, decline, and destruction because when things get tough, we quit waiting on God for what only He can do. And for those of you who've never yet experienced a relationship with God, you're not even sure He exists, you, you haven't opened your life to Him, or you've closed your life off to Him after being disappointed for whatever reason, you just need to know that since we're human beings with great limits, and there are many things we can't control, many things we can't do, if we're not waiting on God for what only He can do, we're never going to experience the potential that He created us for. And many of us give up on this. We get so discouraged. Life's not going on our way, going our way, and God's not answering the prayers as we pray them, and our dreams aren't coming true, and so we get mad at Him, and we pull away from Him, and because we quit waiting on God for what only He can do, we miss out on everything God intends for us. I love the story in Exodus chapter 14. Israel just experienced God's outpouring of, of help. He answered their prayers. He came down. He broke the back of Pharaoh in Egypt through the plagues, and Pharaoh finally let them go, and they went, and God led them with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud to a specific place before the Red Sea, closed off every other way but one, and then Pharaoh changed his mind and brought his arm, and he was coming towards them, and Israel had no place to go but through the Red Sea, and there's no way they could do that. But the difference between Moses and the people of Israel was that Moses kept doing what he could and should be doing, and Moses kept waiting on God to do what only God could do, and Israel didn't. Israel reminds me more of me and probably you. Look at Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. And there they were, the Egyptians, marching after them to destroy them. And they were trapped with the Red Sea behind them. And they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert today? Moses didn't bring them here. God did with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. What they've done here is they've given up on waiting for God to do what only God could do. They've stopped trusting him. And was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us, Moses, bringing us out of Egypt? They lowered all of life to human. They stopped waiting on God, stopped looking to God. And didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve? We'd rather be slaves here. It would have been better for us to be slaves to the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They just quit waiting on God for what God could do. And Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. We're in the perfect situation. We've done what we can and should be doing. We've followed God. We've followed the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. We're right here. We've done everything we can do and should be doing. Now we're in this perfect situation where it's time for God to do what only he can do. So don't be afraid. He says, stand firm. Be confident. You'll see the deliverance of the Lord. He's going to bring it today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. 
many of us miss everything God has for us because we quit doing what we can and should be doing and we quit waiting on God for what only God can do and many of us miss what God has for us because we quit, let me just put it in three words, expecting God's best. We just quit expecting His best. Because we're experiencing life's worst, we start blaming God for what we're experiencing. We start saying, God's not good because life's not good. God's not good because my circumstances aren't good. God's not good because my goals aren't being accomplished for good. God's not good because he's not answering my three wishes when I rub his golden lamp. And when we experience the worst of this life, we start expecting God's worst. We start blaming Him, and when we quit expecting God's best, we will never experience life as He designed it. And let's be honest, this is where most of us live most of the time. It's true of me. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. This is what we should be expecting. God says that God's people had given up expecting His best. They, they thought He was trying to hurt them, and He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They're not plans to hurt you. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They're plans to give you hope and a future. Don't you understand that I'm always good and I'm always working towards your good? Don't you understand that I'm always righteous? I always do what's right and, and there's never a moment that I'm not doing right. Don't you understand that I'm faithful and that's all I can be? I will fulfill my promises. 2020 has been an interesting year, and I've seen so many people just give up, quit on expecting God's best. It's true it's a bad year, but it's not true God's a bad God. It's true it's a dark year, but it's not true that God is casting the darkness. God is leading us through the darkness with His light to His light, and we have to keep expecting His best. I, I mean, this is important to remember. Look at Isaiah 49, verse 23. I, I hope you'll cling to this promise. Those who hope in me, God says, will not be disappointed. And yet, can we be honest? So many of us live in disappointment. And why are we living in disappointment? Because we're not hoping in him. We're not expecting his best. We're not realizing that he's doing what he always does, the right thing, the good thing, leading us in the right way. We've given up on him. And what we have to do is we have to stop quitting on doing what we can and should be doing. We have to stop quitting on waiting for him to do what he and only he can do. And we have to stop quitting on expecting his best. So here's the truth that I want to lay down for you. We can experience God's rebuilding. We can experience God's work. We can experience God's touch and potential in our lives by continuing to do what we can and should be doing while at the same time Trusting him to do what only he can and should do. Let me give you a bunch of verses. When, when God gives one verse of a truth, that's a truth. But when God keeps repeating the truth over and over and over, you can know it's really important. And this is one of those truths. He just repeats over and over. So let me kind of walk through a little bit of Scripture with you. Look at Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory... Rests with the Lord. Do you see the two sides there? Who prepares the horse for battle? We do. I mean, God doesn't come down and groom the horse and train the horse and put the bridle on the horse and train it for battle. We have to do it. We have to train the horse for battle. We can do that. The horse is made ready for the day of battle by us. But that doesn't win the victory. Victory rests with the Lord. So at the same time, we're doing what we can and should be doing. We have to be trusting God to do what only he can do, bring the victory. Let, let me give you a really, I don't know if it's a great example, but the best example I can come up with. I have a dog named Lincoln. And the weird thing about Lincoln is he's far more popular in this church than I am. I mean, Lincoln, my dog, Golden Doodle, crazy. Uh, he was a he was the mascot of the pandemic, right? In the quarantine thing, sitting right under my deal, became part of most of my talks. And 
and now he thinks Thursday Live is his thing, and I just get to be there with him. It's just crazy, but it, Lincoln's beloved here. I'll walk through the hallway with Lincoln, and no one will give me eye contact. All they care about is Lincoln. I'll make a post about Lincoln on social media, and there'll be thousands and thousands of comments. I make a post about me or Jesus, and everybody's going, who cares, you know? I mean, Lincoln's unbelievable. And you know what? Lincoln is a great dog. I mean, he, I can walk through a crowded hallway here and say heel, and he'll be right on my heel right there, and he won't deter until I release him to go talk to people. I mean, this is an amazing dog, amazing. Wherever I'm at, I can let him out, and he will not wander beyond the boundaries where he's supposed to go, and he'll come back in. Our neighbors are crazy amazed at this dog. But he didn't just pop out that way. Do you know how Lincoln became so disciplined? I worked hard to discipline him. I worked hard to train him to be a great dog. So if you love Lincoln, you should love me more, is kind of the thought here. But beyond that, I mean, I trained him. But can I also tell you, victory rests with the Lord. I've worked really hard to train other dogs. And those dogs sucked. I mean, I did everything I could do to train those dogs, and they'd run into the highways, and they'd do this thing, and they'd be crazy bad dogs. See, that's how life is. It's true we can train a horse, but it's not true we can ensure victory. It's true we can train a dog, but it's not true that we can ensure that dog will be a great dog. We can do what we can do and need to, but we have to trust God to do what only he can do. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The verse, this says the same thing. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Keep doing what you can and should be doing. Working for the Lord. Working for the Lord. Working for the Lord. Trusting him. Obeying him. Living for him. Doing what you should be doing. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's a lot of things I can do that would be totally vain unless God does what only he can do. I can stay steadfast like Moses did. I can stay steadfast like anyone who's lived for him. I can remain constant if I keep doing what I can and should be doing while at the same time knowing God's the one who converts that to something meaningful. I don't know what God's doing with 2020. But I do know that God's doing something great with 2020. And the only way I'm going to experience the diamonds at the end of the pickaxe swinging is if I keep doing what I can and should be doing and keep trusting him. Are you? Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. I can continue to be steadfast in moving forward. I don't have to allow myself to be defeated by the circumstances. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. God will give the harvest. God will do what only he can do if we keep doing what we can and should be doing. The problem is we don't. We quit doing what we can be doing, and we quit trusting him to do what only he can do, and so we don't experience anything he intends for us. I mean, that's really the whole conversation this weekend. But God's given us pictures of this, and the picture we're looking at in this series is Nehemiah. Nehemiah. He's a great example. And here's what I want you to see from Nehemiah this weekend. Nehemiah shows us that we can and should be doing certain things when things get tough. Instead of doing what comes naturally, quitting and giving up and pulling back, he shows us that we can and should be doing certain things when things get tough. And I want to show you what those things are. And, and I don't want to pretend like these things are super deep. I want to proclaim that these things are super vital. And there's a difference. It's not deep that you need to drink water to live, but it's vital that you drink water to live. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine. He was the cupbearer to the king, the, the one that tested the food and tasted the food and made sure that the king wasn't going to get poisoned or taken out. When the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. 
not a good thing for the cupbearer to be sad. Might be an indication that he's doing something, right? I had never been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, dude, what's happening? Okay, he didn't say it exactly like that. He said, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? What's going on? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. I'm not against you. I want you to live forever. There's another reason for my sadness. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? It's because God's city and God's people are laying in ruins that I'm sad. So why was he sad? Because of that, he cared about God and God's people. Why was he afraid? Because, and you probably don't know this, Jerusalem was still in reasons, ruins and brokenness because this same king, Artaxerxes, ordered the rebuilding of Jerusalem stopped. In Ezra chapter 4, verse 21, you can turn to it sometime and look at that. He, he stopped it because some people around him told him it was posing a threat. This rebuilding was posing a threat, and so he stopped it. He brought it to a halt, and now what's Nehemiah doing? He's saying, King, I want to go and rebuild the city that you stopped being rebuilt because you saw it as a threat. When the cupbearer to the king comes with that message, it's not necessarily going to be taken well. Why was he afraid? Because he was a slave in captivity to this king. His only value as a slave to this king was serving the king, pleasing the king, not serving some foreign god in some foreign country. Some slave says, hey, you know, serving you is pretty cool, but I'd rather go serve my god and my country. The king's going to go, you're out. I mean, kings would kill people for this back then. That's why he was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because kings expected their servants to always be happy in their presence. I mean, these kings thought they were gods, and you were so lucky if you got to be in their presence. And if you're not happy being in their presence, what are you saying? They're not worthy of your happiness. Another reason to take them out. Asking to leave the king's presence and service was an insult to the king. And so Nehemiah was afraid. Let's just put it down on the foundational level. Nehemiah was in a very tough situation, very tough. It would have been easy to stop doing what he could and should be doing, obeying God, trusting God, living out God's promises, speaking, you know, all that stuff. It would have been very easy for him to stop trusting God in this moment because this king could have taken his life at any moment. But he didn't quit. Rather, he shows us exactly what we should be doing and can be doing in the face of the same kind of circumstances in any part of our lives. This is true personally. This is true relationally in our marriages and families. This is true in our careers. This is true in our spiritual life. I mean, this is how we should be living. In the face of difficult circumstances, Nehemiah teaches us that we can and should continue praying. I I know, it's like me saying drink water, but that's pretty vital. We can and should continue praying. And I know you know this, but as I said last weekend, it doesn't mean you're doing it. And I've missed out on a ton of potential in my life. I've missed out on a ton God wants for me in life simply because I quit doing what I could and should be doing. I quit praying. I kind of pull away. I don't say I don't believe in God anymore, and I don't say I'm mad at God anymore, and I don't express the disappointment, and I still get up on this platform and talk to you about God every week, but in my personal life, I'm just not talking to him very much. Why should I? You know what I'm talking about, right? You do the same thing. We miss out on so much because we quit. So what can we and should we be doing? We should be continuing to pray. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The king said to me, what is it you want? Now remember, he had been praying for four months already. We saw that last week, and we'd been praying for four months already, just waiting for God to open the door a little bit. And when the king finally said, what do you want? God's opening the door. What did Nehemiah do? He just jumped right through the door, right? No, you know what he did? He prayed again. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. 
He just kept praying. And he said, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so I can rebuild it. So after four months of praying, what did he keep doing? He kept praying. He kept praying. He kept praying. Why? Because that's all he could do. Sometimes the only thing we can do as human beings is pray. Isn't that where Moses was before the Red Sea? Hey, God, you know, here we are. We've been following that cloud and that pillar. We don't have any place to go anymore. Uh, Pharaoh's coming. So now is time for you to do what only you can do. Israel was complaining. Moses was praying. Which are you doing? We need to learn from this. If we're ever going to be a part of God building or rebuilding anything, there are going to be times when all we can do is keep praying until he works in our marriages, in our families, in our careers, in our churches, in our nation. And can I just be honest with you? Sadly, my tendency is to push and to pressure and to manipulate, to try and accomplish what I really can't accomplish, only God can accomplish, and I do it to try and get my way, but in the end, it's very destructive and very unproductive. If Nehemiah had tried to manipulate the king, he would have never accomplished anything for God. His dream would have died with him when the king killed him. All he could do was wait on God and pray. He was successful because he just kept praying. He just kept praying. How about you? It's the one thing you can do no matter what the circumstances. Last weekend, I told you we're starting 40 days, 40 prayers, Monday tomorrow. Why are we doing it? Because the one thing we can do in 2020 is keep praying. And I want to encourage you to do it. You can follow the links, do whatever on the screen right now to sign up. Please get involved in that. But let's go further than this. In the face of difficult circumstances, Nehemiah teaches us something else. He teaches us that we can and should continue planning. Now, that doesn't sound very spiritual. What? Continue planning? Yeah. I mean, we can and should continue planning. This is something we can always do. In fact, what I have learned, when I stop planning, it's because I've stopped waiting on God to do what only he can do. Moses was still planning what he was going to do as the leader of Israel when Pharaoh was chasing him down and the Red Sea was behind him. He was still planning. Why? Because he believed with all of his heart that God was going to do what he promised to do. I stop planning when I stop waiting, don't you? Are you planning these days? Or are you complaining these days? Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy? Do you see, I, I, a lot of people just read through this passage and don't get it. He knew how much time he would need because he had kept planning. He knew from whom he would need protection because he kept planning. He knew what resources and provisions he would need in order to complete the job. He kept planning. You see, he wasn't just a dreamer. He invested himself in developing a workable plan to accomplish the dream. He did what he could do while he waited on God to do what only he could do. Are you? Finally, in the face of difficult circumstances, Nehemiah shows us that we can and should continue believing. And as a pastor and as a Jesus follower, let me just tell you, this is where I have the deepest concern. I'm watching so many people just quit believing. They just quit believing. In fact, you know how you've quit, you can know if you've quit believing? When you stop praying, you've stopped believing. When you stop planning, you've stopped believing. You just stop living. You just complain. You just whine. You become a victim. 
And that's where so many are. So many have walked out of God's church because they've stopped believing in him. So when things get tough, when things get bad, when things get dark, when things get filled with despair, we can and should continue believing, expecting God's best even in the midst of life's worst. That's what Nehemiah did. Look at Nehemiah 2.8. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon him, but upon me, the king granted my request. He never, ever stopped believing that God's gracious hand was on him even when he was in the toughest of circumstances. Have you? Look at Isaiah 49, 23 again. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed, but those who don't hope in him are always disappointed. It's so sad for me to see so many people living in disappointment. It just means we're not continuing to believe. The reality is when we stop praying and we stop planning, it's just a clear indication that we've stopped believing. Have you? And here's the deal. This is no small matter. In fact, quite frankly, I think all of life is built on it in the end. So if we're going to avoid making the choices and living our lives in a way that lead to disappointment, to loss, to decline, to destruction, we have to keep believing. And because it's so important, I'm just wanting you to take the next couple of minutes to think about it and to reflect on it. And then I'll come back and we'll spend some time. so many years have you been hoping that things would have changed by now have you cried all the faith you have through so many tears don't forget the things that he has done before and remember he can do it all once more it's like the brightest sunrise waiting on the other side of the darkest night don't ever lose hope hold on and believe maybe you just haven't seen it just haven't seen it yet you're closer than you think you are only moments from the break of dawn all his promises always up ahead maybe you just haven't seen it just haven't seen it yet oh, Maybe you just haven't seen it Just haven't seen it yet Maybe you just haven't seen it He had the solution Before you had the problem He sees the best in you When you feel like your worst so in the questioning, don't ever doubt his love for you. Cause it's only in his love that you find a breakthrough. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like the brightest sunrise waiting on the other side of the darkest night. Don't ever lose hope. Hold on and believe maybe you just haven't seen it. Just haven't seen it yet. Just haven't seen it yet 
Don't you absolutely love the line that God has the solution before we ever have the problem? It's just we haven't seen it yet. This is why we have to keep doing what we can and should be doing and waiting on God to do what only God can do. It's why we have to keep expecting His best and trusting Him. So let me give you the application that I think maybe can carry us through, not just this next week, but maybe the rest of our lives. If we're going to experience God's rebuilding in our lives, then we have to make the choice to never stop, to never stop, to never stop praying. Question, what do you need to be praying for right now that you're not? What have you stopped praying for? that you need to be praying for. It's time to keep praying. If we're really going to experience God's rebuilding in our lives, we have to make the choice to never stop planning. Because when we stop planning, we stop living. We lose so much in it. But if we keep believing that God is going to do what only He can do, then we can keep planning for when He does it. What do you need to be planning for right now that you aren't? What do you need to be planning for in your marriage, in your family, in your career, in your personal life, in your spiritual life? Man, keep planning. And if we're going to experience God's rebuilding in our lives, we have to make the choice to never stop never, ever stop believing. So what do you need to be believing God for right now that you aren't? This entire conversation is meant to provoke you, to compel you, to motivate you, to once again doing what you can and should be doing. Waiting on God to do what only He can do and not mixing those two up and, in the end, to just keep believing. Because as Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let's stop missing out on the potential. Let's stop missing out on what God has for us. And let's start experiencing what God has for us. So just before we end, I'm going to ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer. And as we pray, every single one of us has something to have a conversation with God about. There's an area that you're weak here on. I know there is in my life, and that's why I've been spending time on it. I want you to spend time with Him right now. And while you're praying, for those of you who've never experienced Jesus in His first touch in your life, I want to pray with you. In fact, if you're hearing His knock in your life, if you are sensing your need for Him, I'm going to pray. And just take my words and make them your words. In, in your prayer, just say, Jesus, I, I'm recognizing your presence, your reality right now. I've stopped doing what I should be doing. I've sinned against you. I've messed up. I've left you out of my life. I've stopped waiting on you and believing in you to do what only you could do. I've blown it, but that changes now. Jesus, you died on the cross so that my sin and failures could be forgiven and removed. You rose again so I could have new life. And so I'm inviting you by faith to change me, save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me, let us know. It's really easy. Text us to 313131, that's the number, and just one word message, Northridge, the name of our church. We'll send you a link, fill that out, takes about a minute, and then get it back to us, and we will kind of support you as you move forward in your relationship with God. We'd love to be take that part of your life and make it a little easier. And for the rest of us, don't forget, 
God is builder and rebuilder. You might have lost a ton of stuff in areas of your life, but that's okay. God can rebuild it if you let him. The choice is yours. The choice is ours. Let's make that choice together. And until then, I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everybody.